Welcome back. So just uh, apologies ahead of time. This video is going to be sort of a bit of a mix up of different things. I've got two different days of flying here and a little bit of work on uh, redrive and stuff like that. So I'll try and sort of um, keep it uh, logically ordered. So this was two days ago. Um, this was just a short flight. And the goal on this flight was to see what happened if I just kept the prop at flat pitch. And I was just going to take it up to a thousand feet, level out pull the power back, let everything cool off, and then um, see if I could figure out exactly, you know, how the how best the aircraft would climb. Because, uh, you know, my goal is, a uh, uh, next future goal here is to figure out what VX and VY is best, um, best rate and best angle of climb, or best angle and best rate of climb, X and Y. Um, but anyway, I f on this particular flight, I felt like the aircraft was just not performing very well. Um, and you know, looking back at the logs and everything like that, I think I've figured out what was going on, because uh, you know I only got to about I think 1,200 feet and just kind of stopped there and said, yeah, it's just not, it just it's not feeling it. It wasn't the same as you know a couple of days before that in the last video that you saw. And so what I've determined is that the the way where the reduction drive is, um, the 158 to one, and also the way the governor is configured right now, um, it's allowing the engine to push past 3,800. In fact, quite often times in the, in the start of this flight, the RPM on the engine was over 3,900. And so it's pushing the prop beyond what it was designed to run at in the flat pitch. And I think what's happening is it's basically uh, somewhat cavitating a little bit. And so um, just not getting the same performance out of it as if you pull the prop back. And so really what it, it comes down to is that um, I need to have the governor dialed in just a little bit so the engine never hits 3800 rpm because at that point then the prop is just not working very well at all and then I think uh, you know dialing the prop back sooner as soon as I can um, you know to bring the engine rpm down further is going to make things uh, you know even better so that, you know the sooner I do it the better but the takeaway from this flight is um, you know, running at a high RPM for any length of time just creates problems. Uh, the engine gets hotter, it's burning more fuel, uh, the prop is definitely, um, you know, not performing as well as it could because it's spinning faster than it was designed to spin. Um, you know, so all, all of these sort of factors were learnt on this flight. Um, and so I think going forward, I can't really, well potentially I could dial in the flat pitch of the prop. Um, you know, just add a little bit more coarseness to it so it never hits uh, 3800. Um, but for now, just for testing going forward, I think what I'm going to do is just uh, hit the, go the governor a tiny little bit so it'll keep the engine uh, under 3800 RPM. And then, of course, you know, right after takeoff, once I'm climbing out, immediately keep dropping it back, which we'll see. You'll see what I did in yesterday's flight, which was uh, much better. Uh, performing, but anyway, that's the takeaway from from this particular flight. Um, that you're just running at high RPM is just not good um, on the prop, and you know, obviously on the engine too, because everything got hotter, and then I just didn't even have any bandwidth there to to try and get the temperatures to cool down. And then ultimately, what I ended up doing here, a little ways in, I was just like, well, this is not working. And I pulled the prop back. Um, just a little bit there and you know things improve but at that point I was just like well the engines already sort of you know heat soaked from this little adventure I'll just call it a day and go back and look at the numbers and everything and you know I was still also s skeptical that something was kind of robbing horsepower and as you'll see coming up I, I have um, a fairly good idea what that might have also been as well I'm not 100% sure but um, you know I'm feeling somewhat confident that I've found something that's robbing horsepower and you see here, there was a, a little bit of uh, you know disturbance in the air this um, this day. It was just a little bit bumpy, and you know something else I think I've uh, discovered from the aircraft is like um, it's either the larger winglets um, or the swept wing or the larger fuselage or something. But the aircraft seems to definitely get maybe more of a response or a reaction to uh, hitting you know a bit of turbulence than what I'm used to in other aircraft. And 
possibly the larger winglets and potentially you know going into production I would really like to make the winglets not quite as tall but maybe have a longer cord and that's you know not that difficult to do um, but anyway it still needs to be proven and as you'll see from yesterday's flight when I got up into the smooth air I mean everything was rock solid uh, but anyway, so that's the takeaways from this particular flight. Uh, don't run the engine uh, at high RPM because the prop doesn't like it. Everything gets hot and, you know, it's just, just not ideal. So uh, let's move on to uh, the next flight. All right, so before we move on to the next flight, something that's been um, just showing up recently was a minor oil leak in this feed to the, um, to the redrive here. And... I'm pretty sure it was coming from how the feed goes in there, one of the O-rings. But what's interesting is if you look there in the center of the screen there, where I'm zooming in there, there's a puddle of oil sitting on that ridge there. I'm like, how did that get there? And there's also oil on the bottom of this cap here and oil on the bottom of that little nut there. And I'm like, how is oil getting up onto there and then running down? So I was trying to figure it out. And I think what was happening was the oil was leaking past the O-ring under high pressure and it was kind of vaporizing. And then with the air rushing around, uh, you know, in the cowling here, um, there was kind of oil just sort of vaporizing everywhere. And then ultimately it was just sort of getting on everything and, and collecting in those places. So anyway, more on that uh, in a little bit. Okay, so the mission of this flight was to start with the prop just back a little bit so the engine wouldn't exceed 3,800 RPM and then uh, right after lift off, retract the gear and then bring back the prop a little bit more and then uh, continue to do so uh, on the climb out to get the prop all the way to course pitch and try and maintain uh, full power as long as possible and at the same time, you know, trying to keep the temperatures as low as possible. Right off the tower at the 352 Tango Delta, I'm holding short of uh, 17. Reactor 352. Tango Delta, let off the tower. Left close, traffic approved, report midfield, runway 17, clear for takeoff. Yeah, left close, traffic approved, uh, runway 17, clear for takeoff, we'll report midfield, uh, 352 Tango Delta. And winds were out of the southeast about sort of five to six or seven, eight knots there uh, at the ground level, and temperatures were about 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Approaching runway two. Entered runway two two. Five thousand five hundred feet remaining. And with respect to this little oil leak, I had put um, you know some paper Approaching towel around that uh, one, hole fitting there to cover the whole thing up, and put some cable ties around it so any oil that did leak out of that was just going to be, be absorbed one, in the seven. paper towel, and that way it wasn't going to make uh, you know a big mess. Or at least hopefully that was the plan. Entered runway 17, 7,800 feet remaining. And I overcompensated for the left crosswind a little bit too much and let the aircraft sort of point a little bit to the right to start with, so it took me a little bit to bring it back on to uh, center line, but you know, a nice wide runway allows you to do that. I'm still sort of getting a handle on um, crosswind control in the aircraft because obviously I haven't had much experience yet with uh, strong to you know, medium to strong crosswinds. And I'd also put like another five pounds in the nose, so it took a little bit longer of a roll uh, to get off the ground, but I wanted to see what it was like with a more forward CG. And, you know, coming off the ground, it was actually fairly bumpy, um, as you can see here, and then there was a fire off to the left there, somebody was burning something. And I've managed to get the uh, camera stabilizer, or yeah, the image stabilization turned off on this camera now, so it's less rocking around, it just matches the fuselage. But as you see, when I come through the heat of this smoke, I get bumped around pretty decently there. And I to sort of, you know, just compensate for that. But it wasn't much, and I'm pretty sure that it was a pretty solid inversion at, I would say, maybe even below a thousand feet, because, you know, it was bumpy like this, and getting tossed around, and then all of a sudden you sort of just break out of it. And it was kind of like being in the surf, and then all of a sudden getting out past the breakers. Um, things just completely stabilized more so than any other flight that I've had and it was just the air was dead still. Now there was a 20 knot uh, wind blowing at altitude but it was completely um, stable air and as you'll see in the, in the overlay there 
Um, you can see my airspeed sort of go up and down and up and down, and it's on every leg, you know, my ground speed, um, actually, because that's, you know, the Garmin showing the ground speed there. Um, the one, the cabin view, there, yeah, that one there, you can see my speeds going up and down the ground speeds, obviously, you know, because of the, the wind at altitude, but if you look how stable everything is there, I mean, it's just rock solid. I, I mean, I honestly just fly it hands off completely. Um, so that was good, and you know, I was climbing really well to start out with. Um, everything seemed pretty good. The temperatures weren't bad. I was pulling the prop back, sort of, you know, waiting about 15 seconds, pull it back a little bit more, and then do it again, you know, with 15 seconds. And uh, you know, climb was decent. Um, but you know, as you'll see, uh, it sort of starts to. Um, or it feels like it's performing not so so good, you know, once I get up to sort of 2200 feet and, you know, I'm climbing, you know, with an indicated airspeed of... Uh, well, uh, uh, Raptor 352 Tango Delta is now mid-field, uh, 1700. I'm going to continue to climb and just stay in the pattern here if you don't mind. Raptor 352 Tango Delta, stay in pattern. I'm uh, just going to continue to climb here um, and just stay in the pattern, but you know, I'll be well over the airport. So as you can see there, I'm climbing quite happily at 130 knots on 14 gallons an hour, um, but it seems to just, you know, uh, after I get to this, you know, altitude 2,200 feet, uh, I level off and th things just start to feel like I'm just sort of losing power. And I was thinking, well, maybe just everything hotter is just not running so well. But, you know, then my thoughts were going to, um, you know, something else robbing power. And honestly, I think what's happening is that those redrive belts there are getting tighter and tighter as uh, that whole pulley system um, gets hotter and it's just starting to rob power. So. Um, I'm going to stop here and just um, show you what I've been working on. Raptor 352 Tango Delta, do not overfly the runway while orbiting over the airport. I uh, copy that, I'll just stay to the east of the uh, airport then and climb over here uh, to Tango Delta. Okay, so let's take a break from this flight and we'll come back and I'll let you, for the hardcore people who want to watch the whole thing, I'll let you watch the remainder of that flight, um, sort of without any interruption, but let's uh, take a break and, and show you what I've been working on since this flight and then we'll come back to this. Alright, so onto the redrive and I was having a problem with the oil leaking out of here. So this is the, uh, this is the feed line, so that, that nut goes in there. And then this one goes in there and feeds into the oil shuttle, which is, you know, down inside there. Which, when I rotate that around, you'll be able to see, you know, there's the opening there where that feeds in there. You can see if I move that around. Um, so anyway, what was happening was, there's the two O-rings here, and these, this is the old o-rings here just a black black ones now these aren't high temp ones and this one here um, that basically sits against this uh, this face here was fine I don't believe it was leaking uh, but the other one here is it goes around this shaft there and what was happening was because of the high temp oil coming in here when it got to about 250 this thing can't handle that and you can actually feel that it's gone kind of a bit hard and so it wasn't sealing very well, and then ultimately oil was coming out, um, coming out around, around the whole fitting and stuff there. So um, just getting a little trickle of oil around there, and that's you know just from extended running now. So I'm starting to find little things that need to be adjusted. So anyway, you can see I've got these new high temp uh, O-rings on there, a little bit fatter than the previous ones, so that should seal off nicely, and that'll fix that minor little oil leak uh, that I was getting in there so that's good and everything's fine with the rest of the redrive that there's no um, play in the whole unit it's turning nicely um, everything feels really good uh, with respect to that so that's a uh, you know just having a little minor oil leak from a from an o-ring not a big deal so that'll be sorted out 
Okay, so this is a bit bigger problem. You see, obviously, I got everything pulled apart here. Um, but this uh, tensioner here um, that pushes against the belt, um, there's a little piece that fits in here. Right now, I've got it at the machine shop. They're just um, extending the arm or the little um, pin that goes in there to the, the arm that's on here. And I had put a little spring on there in order to have a spring load on this. But the spring I had and the amount of space I had for it wasn't enough. So I had to keep... Um, tightening it up and what ends up happening is when the redrive when everything starts warming up this uh, aluminum pulley here uh, expands more and so the belts get tighter and they get progressively tighter and tighter and unless this can take it up with the spring loading like allow it to sort of you know uh, tighten up then um, it's just basically just jacking you know a lot of force and stuff on the belts on the redrive and I think what's happened is that's sucking horsepower um, because I noticed, you know, when when I'm flying there, when I start out, everything seems like I've got lots of power, and as things warm up, it f feels like I'm really, you know, not getting as much power. And, you know, when you land and stuff, t just turning the prop by hand, you can hear that these belts are really jacked up tight, and you come and take the cowling off, loosen this off there, and you can see there's a, quite a lot of uh, turns and stuff you've got to loosen this off before it actually takes the, all the pressure off the belts there. So anyway, I'm adjusting this uh, little arm here, putting a longer spring on it that's actually uh, um, with a heavier tension. So it'll have more play, but it'll actually put more uh, force on it, but it'll allow it to give. Um, so anyway, that's another thing, and that, that should actually gain me back some horsepower. And under here with this coupling here, everything still looks good with that. When I took the lower redrive out, it just basically slid directly out. So this is still nicely aligned. Everything, there's nothing weird going on with that, so that's uh, good news on that front. I don't know how well that you can see it here, but the belts look in good shape there. No problems with those, no wearing on the ends or anything like that. Um, and you know, all the teeth are fitting nicely into uh, you know the slots in the in the pulleys, so everything's looking good with respect to those. Now there is another little issue going on here. You can see there's a little groove that's been worn in here so there's a little spacer that holds this off of the end of here so you see there's a little step there so there's a little spacer in there that's um, a bit more than a quarter of an inch uh, long and that just basically holds the pulley to stop it from running into here well the problem is with the design it was just too too uh, thin so I'm getting the machine shop making a larger kind of donut one like that um, and then because of that, what's ended up happening is um, that pulley was able to move a little bit like this and then the, you know, the over-tensioning on the belts and stuff has caused the um, spline drive here, not on here, but, but in there, it's caused the spline drive um, you know, to wear a little bit so it's not fitting as tight as what it could. Um, it has a little bit of slop in it. Um, so what I'm going to do is have the larger donut um, spacer here which is just going to have like a diameter around about the, matching the same as this instead of the little thin diameter and then I'm going to put um, an o-ring in there a big a big fat o-ring I've got right here that I've already got so that's going to be in between this new spacer and that and so it's going to act kind of like as a spring washer and then the bolt on the other side, which holds it, everything tight, will be, I'll be able to crank it down against this and really get that thing to snug up nicely. And of course, you know, being this is a, it's a pretty heavy, um, pretty solid uh, O-ring, I'll be able to crank it down on there and, and get a constant tension on there and then safety wire the bolt on the other end so it can't back out. And that way it'll keep constant tension. Hopefully that'll, um, stop this from having any sort of movement in any any particular direction and with the new spring tensioner on the belts there that um, you know should have everything working back to normal and worst case scenario if it doesn't work fine I can still run this for a while it won't be you know ideal but obviously I've been running it up till now um, but what I'll end up doing is just getting this boss this inside boss here re a remachined a new one made and then later on swap it out but it's not going to slow me down because this one is still serviceable uh, it's not going to fail or anything like that but uh, it'd be nice to have it nice and snug so it's not moving around anyway so that's probably the biggest um, problem with this and then 
we'll see when I get this um, spacer back from the machine shop get it all snugged up there and see how it all works and just to show you the spring this is the spring that I had in there and that's all I could fit in there um, the way that thing was configured and now that I'm getting it adjusted I should be able to fit a spring in there that's three times the length of this um, and so this one here it's fairly strong but when I was adjusting it it felt you know once it's in there it feels like it's not enough so I've got these two springs to test with this one will probably be the perfect length although this one is probably too a little bit too firm and then this one's a little bit softer spring uh, but I'll have to cut it down uh, to length so anyway I've got three choices and I also have like uh, you know more length of this if I want to cut down another piece of this to longer so I'll have th three different uh, hardnesses of spring there spring rates and I'll be able to dial in and get the one that's right because you know ultimately I want to make sure that it's not um, that there's enough tension on there that the belt doesn't skip at full power uh, but I also want to make it that it's not too much tension that when it all expands that it can the spring can compress and take up that expansion and just you know don't over over uh, stress the belts so anyway that's what's going on with those springs all right one last minute late uh, addition to this uh, video, I did get the parts there while I was in the middle of doing these edits. Uh, they called and said it was there. So there's the new spacer there that you can see. And then, you know, in, in front of that is the O-ring. There's the old spacer and you can see how much thinner that was, uh, the wall thickness. And that's why it was eating into the other one. So there's the difference. So it should work out nicely. And this is what it looks like just mocked into place there because I didn't want to pull that whole pulley system out of there. It's a bit tricky to get it out of there. So I've just basically put it on there and tightened up the, the bolt on the end there and it's nice and snug. There's no uh, movement in, in any of the axes there. So that's looking very promising. Um, and as you can see in there, there's the, the bolt um, head in there, snugged it all in and you know, I'll be safety wiring it um, before I finish it off like I had it before. But as you can see, rotates nicely, but there's no sideways play and there's no um, play between you know the shaft there you see that's moving there's no, no play whatsoever it's nice and snug there so I think that's going to work because if it doesn't move it won't wear um, if it moves it'll wear so uh, yeah I got to work um, to try and get it all uh, installed back together after that after that test fit and um, before end of day here where I'm just finishing off this video and actually look in there you can you can just see in there the uh, the o-ring so yeah that's going to work out so anyway i got to work uh, getting that all fully properly back assembled again and this is how i left it here right before finishing to you know trying to finish this video off i've got that all installed there there's no movement in there the belts are on tension is not in there yet i still have to make a little bit of work there or do a little bit of work on that spring and uh, just get the mounting thing sorted out from that. But the whole redrive thing is all back in and bolted in place. The oil connection and the oil drains already connected up. So I don't have much to do. Just get the tensioner sorted out and then button everything up and put the prop on. Okay, so we're back continuing this flight now. And, and I'm just going to let it play out. And you guys can sort of, uh, you know, just watch the whole thing. I might put a comment in here and there. But if you pay attention, you'll notice that... Um, you know, as, as time goes on, I'm doing the same sort of run every time, you know, into the wind heading south, and the performance just seems to degrade each time. Um, you know, and there's really nothing else changing. I'm maintaining or trying to maintain sort of altitude there, and it just gets harder and harder and harder. The aircraft ends up having a, you know, nose up attitude there as time goes on and I could tell something was wrong something you know wasn't great but I wanted to capture some more data while I could so I just sort of uh, stayed in it and uh, you know just as long as I could. Tower uh, 312 Bob Delta is ready to go for 17. Tower 312 Bob Delta Bob Roger. Raptor 25 2 Delta State Position. I'm at 2,300 feet and I'm uh, northeast of the field. Number two, take it up, Roger. About two miles out. November 312, Bob Delta, runway 17. Correction, west 
or not. Papa Delta, one seven, clear for takeoff. West to lead departure. So if you see here, I'm at 11 gallons an hour, indicating 141 knots, and pretty much, you know, staying level here, or indicating 2,300 feet. So just keep that in mind for later on, um, with respect to performance. So 11 gallons an hour, 140 indicated, and you know, pretty much level. 2300 feet. Raptor 352, Tango Delta, remain east of Taxiway Alpha for inbound traffic. I copy that, I'm remaining east of the airport right now. I'm uh, southeast of the airport, about two miles, and it's uh, 2,000 feet. Raptor 352, Tango Delta, Rodney, thank you.
November 550, same position. Yes, sir. Through on 550, three miles uh, from the airport, about to turn uh, into that right down one for two, uh, one seven. November Series on that right down one three one seven. Coming with five five zero. Coming three one five five zero. Coming one seven for the option. Clear for the option, runway Yes, yeah, so there actually be a full stop back to the, uh, down to the FBO. How about that? Over five five here, Rod. Over 550, turn left taxiway Gulf, direction turn left taxiway Foxtrot, contact ground 0.7. Left on Foxtrot over to ground 0.7, thank you.
Delta Tower, ground one one nine three four, short of one seven, like to take off. Clear for takeoff. November one one nine three four. Confirm you're looking for pattern work. Roger that. I'd like to stay close pattern work. November one one nine three four. Right close traffic approved. Report midfield runway one seven. Clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff for one seven. Uh, right turn out nine three four. Raptor three five two. Tango Delta safe position. Yeah, I'm about uh, four miles to the north, uh, east of the field at uh, 2,000, about 1,800 feet right now. Raptor 
Delta Tower, ground on 11934, short of 17, ready to depart. November 11934, traffic is on the east side of the airport, orbiting at about 1500 feet. Right close traffic approved, report midfield, runway 17, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff 17, right turn out, report midfield, 934. Delta Tower, ground number 1134, midfield for runway 17. Number 934, runway 17, here's the option. There for the option 17, 934. All right, so as you remember earlier, I was at basically 11 gallons an hour and 140 knots indicated, maintaining altitude. And now if you look, I'm, you know, 10.2, 10.3 gallons an hour, so slightly down, but my air indicated airspeed 129, 128 there, and I'm losing altitude here slowly. Um, and as you can see, if you sort of follow along there, the pitch attitude on the aircraft seems to be sort of a little bit higher nose up, you know, around about two degrees there right now. So it, it really feels like, you know, I've pitched for the same airspeed, but I'm losing power, and you know, ultimately when you lose power, you're gonna lose altitude. So again, my hypothesis was, or is, that the redrive belts get tighter and tighter and tighter as that gets hotter and you know, everything expands. And then ultimately, you know, you're getting robbed of horsepower because it's taking all that horsepower to turn you know, all that resistance in there with those really tight belts. Um, but I'll get that fixed with the, you know, the new spring tensioner set up on there and get it all dialed in so there's not you know, any sort of you know, too much tension going on there. And then we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it performs, see if that's what is uh, causing this problem. Uh, anyway, I'm going to let you watch the rest of this video out and you'll see when I get a bit lower in for landing here um, on the next turn, I think it is that uh, drop below that altitude there where all of a sudden it becomes bumpy again and it really got you know, tossed around quite a bit there um, in the roll axis a bit. And a little bit of a bumpy landing and stuff, but uh, didn't have, you know, there was no damage or anything like that. But um, it was nice to be up in the smooth air for a long time, but uh, you know, eventually you've got to come down and hit the bumps. So uh, thanks for watching. I'll let this thing just run out to the very end. You can watch the whole thing, or if you've seen enough, then uh, you know, you can tune off and uh, ultimately we'll see you uh, on the next video. So thanks again for watching and uh, watch to the end if you want to. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. Cheers.
1934, right close traffic approved, report midfield until further advice. Roger that, uh, right there now, report midfield.
One mile final runway 17 at Kilo Victor Lima Delta. Warning, airport not in current route. Tower there, 4657s on the visual, 17. There are 4657s on the tower, good morning. Report a three mile final on my 17. We shall report a three mile final for 17 at every 4657. Is that smoke over the field currently? Never 4657, taken. And there 4657. We just see a lot of smoke out here today from some burns. Is that smoke over the field? Uh, the smoke is on the last, like, thousand feet of the runway, but it's off to the left of the field, burning in the, in the, uh, wood. And there are 4657, Roger. Doctor, if you can go down there, continue all the way down to the end if you would like. Turn left, hold short, or turn left, and then contact ground point seven. Yeah, left at the end, ground on point seven two, Tango Delta. 